It may seem counterintuitive to you as a mom, but Dr. Emerson Egrich says your son isn't longing to have an extended heart-to-heart conversation with you. He would prefer that you show up and that the two of you are active together. We encourage mothers, just do an activity with your son. Watch him. Don't even about, just be there and don't say anything. Don't have a phone there. Just watch him for 15 minutes. Just be shoulder to shoulder. You're going to find an energy going into him that you think would only come about through a wonderful quality conversation about our feelings. Shoulder to shoulder activities with him without saying anything can be as effective in his spirit as a two-hour discussion might be with you. This is Family Life Today. Our host is Dennis Rainey. I'm Bob Lapine. There's a lot about being the mom of a teenage son that is counterintuitive. We'll get some insights on the subject today from Emerson Egrich. Stay with us. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. You think it's different for a mom trying to be a mom to a six-year-old versus a 16-year-old? You think there's some... (laughs) some Are you kidding? (laughs) I will never forget when we had uh, two teenage sons, and uh, I forget who it was that said it to me, but someone said, a teenage son is tough on a mom because she used to have these boys, Mm -hmm. these cute little boys that were just kind of the apple of her eye. And then they grew up and went eye to eye with her. Right. And then they passed her. And then they started looking down on her. And uh, that was a tough time. Well, share with our listeners, you haven't shared this story in a long time, but talk about the breakfast that you had with one of your sons where you had to do a little correcting between him and his relationship with his mom. We have two sons, so you can guess which one it is. (laughs) He knows who it is. That's right. He was not dealing kindly. Should I introduce our guest, by the way? Yeah, do that. Ron Deal joins us again, who heads up Family Life Blended. Welcome back, Ron. Thank you. Good to be here. A regular guest here on Family Life Today. And Dr. Emerson Egerich, author of a brand new book called Mother and Son, The Respect Effect. And that ties into his other bestseller, uh, Love and Respect, which has sold bazillions uh, of books. (laughs) Emerson, welcome back. Thank you. So here's the story, Emerson. My son was mugging prosecuting, persecuting. I don't know. There there are enough adjectives with his mom, but it was a hostile takeover. And I was coming home from work and I was not liking the condition, the emotional condition of the love of my life, my wife at the end of the day. Now, how old was your son at this point? I think 15, 16, okay, maybe. Right there, he, yeah. he might've been 17, but I would hope not. You yeah. know, you just, just got to grow up at some point. But anyway, I decided, I said, son, come with me. And so we went out and had breakfast. And it was what I would call, Emerson, a come-to-Jesus breakfast. And I didn't have many of these with any of our kids, but there was probably one of these or two with every one of our children. And with this particular son, I said, you are mugging, you're prosecuting, persecuting your mother, and you just need to know that behind your mother stands your dad. And you just need to know, and you can see my jaw, how, how tight my jaw is right now. See this right here? You're not going to win. You will not. That's a promise, son. I will take you out back, and you will not win. I thought you were going to say, I will take you out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. We were talking about child abuse, but we, we are talking about child warning. This yes. is a warning of a teenage boy, and I have to admit, it didn't work. After the first come to Jesus meeting. And so I think I might have tightened my jaw a bit more and increased the intensity and called my son up and away from barbaric behavior, treating his mom without respect as a woman. It was a corner turning day in our family, a lot nicer to come home to at the end of the day. Is Mm -hmm. it common for a 16 year old son to become disrespectful to his mother and to? Just start to assert himself? Well, we call a 16-year-old boy a sophomore, which is a compound word for Sophia, wisdom, and more, a moron. <laughs> and, and they come they come in and out of say wisdom. That, say that again. I, I just kind of, that was a sweet. A wisdom moron. Yeah. Yeah. A wisdom moron. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so they're, the emphasis more on moron. And so, but this is one of the larger point here is why I encourage 
women to read, love, and respect because if you chop the knees out from underneath your husband by contempt for years when your boy is little, there's going to come this moment when he's 16 years old and you're going to need that father because I don't care if you're a brain surgeon as a female, CEO, I've had women who are corporate leaders, they know that in the home, the boy doesn't care. That's right. And who he does respond to is that male authority. You know, there was a little boy lipping off to his mother, calling her a dummy. He was like 10 years old. You dummy, you dummy, you dummy. And he didn't know his dad was home. And this big hand comes around and grabs him by the shirt and literally lifts him up. And the little boy is hanging there like this with his arm. And his dad says, who's a dummy? And the little boy goes, I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. Well, the truth is, little boys love that. It gives them security. Uh, Rosie Greer was uh, had friends over. The football, NFL football player is huge. And his little boy, like five, wanted to wrestle. And his dad, no, no, we got guests here. And the guests, no, no, Rosie, wrestle. Oh, okay. So they got down to the ground. And literally, Rosie enveloped his little boy. So you couldn't see him other than the two little eyes poking out. And then everybody was quiet. And they heard this little voice in there go, now, Dad, I got you right where I want you. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, boys feel very secure. But there is this point you're making of tremendous disrespect, but that's exactly why I preach this, because there's coming a moment when that 16-year-old boy will take on his mother. And the question is, is whether the father is going to step to the plate at that point and say, you know what? We're not going to do this. This is not honorable. It's not right. And it's that story of the elephants. Did you hear in Africa where they they were trying to balance things out, so they took all these elephant senior males and put them in another country? And then the veterinarians were learning of all the devastating, like hippopotamuses and animals were being brutally murdered that they'd never seen before. And then they became aware that the teenage elephants formed gangs and were just creating havoc because there was no male figure. And they didn't understand that that senior male figure was vital to the inner culture. So they got these big semi trucks to go back and get the senior males. And on the side of the truck, it said, going to kick butt. <laughs> And they brought those senior male back in, and all of that stopped. And the point is that there is a place for the senior male with this authority, with that young male. And and what we want to have people understand is young boys need that because they're, they don't have the self-discipline. Your son did not want to be the way he did. I remember when I used to throw temper tantrums. I was sent to military school for five years, from eighth grade, twelfth grade. I would react in ways I didn't want to, and I needed someone who cared enough for me to get in my face and help me develop the, the inner discipline that I didn't have. And mothers are not designed to do that with a 16-year-old boy, but you were. And those moments are critical in the life of a family. And it's important then that we understand that there are seasons in our parenting, but we must always recognize there will come a moment when that father will in fact move forward in a critical moment that will set the course for that boy's life forever. You may be changing your son's diapers all along, but there's going to come a season when that man steps to the plate and does what will cause that boy to become something that you dreamed he would become because of the father's intervention. One of the reasons we wanted Ron to be in and be a part of this interview is because the dynamic in a blended family is Mm -hmm. often challenging because those lines of attachment and connection aren't what they are in a bio family. And Ron, as you're hearing Emerson talk about the important role a dad plays and the disrespect to a mom, and you're putting that in the grid of uh, a blended family, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, there are challenges to trying to work this out that moms and dads just throw up their hands and go, I don't know what to do here. Yeah, exactly. You know, one of the things Emerson does in this book is is talk about the guides that you want to give mother. That's an acrostic. Yes. That acrostic. And you, you flesh out some of the things that you want moms to be able to do. And one of the things I want people listening to hear is that this book has as much application for stepmoms as it does biological moms and, and single mothers who are uh, mm-hmm. trying to manage it all by themselves with their sons. And so one of the things you talk about in the guides is understanding, understanding so a child is not provoked or exasperated. I'd love for you to unpack that. In particular, one of the things I'm interested in is stepmom's understanding that I have this theory, Emerson, I don't know if I'm right about this, but I think that that stepsons have an even heightened sense of a need for respect from their stepmothers, simply because they are feeling imposed on. 
They're feeling challenged in their relationship, perhaps with their biological mother and their loyalty to their mom. They're feeling life has thrown them a number of curves, and I'm not feeling stable or certain about the future. And you, stepmom, are kind of the embodiment of all the things that I've had to go through and and deal with. And if you're here and I feel safe and comfortable with you, then all of a sudden I feel a little more peace in my life. But if I feel challenged by you, if I feel like you don't understand me at all, then I've got another reason to feel upset and angry at the world. And who's that going to come out on? (laughs) That's going to come out towards the stepmom in particular. So unpack a little bit for us the importance of understanding your your son and his need for respect. Well, that understanding is the U of guides. There's giving, which is the G. U is the understanding, instructing, disciplining, encouraging, and supplicating. Concepts that are salient scriptures that uh, deal with parenting. I looked at everything the Bible says about parenting. I just print Principles. And the one you referenced, both in Colossians and Ephesians, do not provoke your children to anger and do not exasperate them so they lose heart, the ephesians Colossian passage. And that's true for fathers provoking their children mm-hmm. to anger. My dad provoked me. My dad exasperated me. I lost heart. I just closed off to my dad. And the same thing can happen, a mom toward mm-hmm. uh, her son or her daughter. But particularly in this case where you say this dynamic, one of the things I know about a stepmother, she wants to love that boy. Mm-hmm. It's within her nature to love. She wants to love, and she's going to be very intentional about that, and she's going to try every way that she knows to send the message that she loves him. But when she gets upset with him, and he's going to do things that are going to hurt her, it's very easy for her to come across in a way that feels disrespectful to him. And first of all, he may not be assured of her love, but I will tell you this, if she thinks more about how to honor his spirit, respect his spirit, not just love on him, Mm. but respect his spirit, he'll begin to feel affection, positive affection for her. It's backwards to a woman. But what I say is when a man feels that you honor him, he then begins to have fond feelings of affection for you. It doesn't seem natural to a woman because that's not the way you operate. But trust me, when you honor his spirit, when you respect his spirit, even though he's failed you, he will begin to have fond feelings. Will he cry? Will he write poetry to you? Will he come to you and put arms? No. He will be very withdrawn. Mm -hmm. But there's a thought process that's going on that's magnificent. And I want you to just trust me. Take it by faith. If you read this book and you start doing these things as a stepmother toward that boy who's elbowing you verbally, just stay the course. Don't get defeated. You're the adult here. He's not. Just keep on this. Trust me. You're being principled principle driven here and the principle will work. Is it a guarantee that he's going to be a perfect boy? No, but you're not a perfect person. But I will tell you, it'll be far less imperfect. You don't want this to move into chaos. And when you keep this honor language going, it'll contain that. There's another acronym in the book that helps us understand what's going on in the heart of a teenage boy or a a younger boy for that matter. It's the acronym CHAIRS. And you use that to, to get to what are the inner desires of a boy. And if we understand those, it'll help us with how we relate to our Correct. Sons. In our Love and Respect Conference, I talk about what God has said to wives to understand about men and masculinity. And these, again, are salient scriptures. And chairs deals with that. Men have a need for conquest. They, they have a need to offer their insight. They have a need to relate with you shoulder to shoulder without talking. For instance, on that point, we encourage mothers just Do an activity with your son. Watch him. Don't even involve. Just be there and don't say anything. Don't have a phone there. Just watch him for 15 minutes. Just be shoulder to shoulder. You're going to find an energy going into him that you think would only come about through a wonderful quality conversation about our feelings. (laughs) Trust me. You have to take it by faith. Shoulder to shoulder activities with him without saying anything can be as effective in his spirit as a two-hour discussion might be with you. There's a reason why guys get together and play pickup basketball and why women get together and have coffee and yeah, talk, right? It's the way people bond. Women develop rapport by giving the report. Men build rapport with each other by being active together, feeling like we're in this together, a sense of camaraderie, and it's usually activity-oriented. 900,000 men go hunting in Michigan on opening day. Why? Because you have to be out in the field and you can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read just the beginning of chapter four, which is, Seeing the man in the boy, and and it's subtitled, His Six Desires, and that's back to what Bob was talking about, C-H-A-I-R-S. Here's what you say. I think this is just a great way to for a mom to think about her son. Who is the man in the boy? 
The best way to see a man in the making is to recognize the six desires God seeded that he placed in your son. God designed him with the desires to, and then you list six categories. Number one, to work and achieve. Number two, to provide for, protect, and even die. Three, be strong, lead, and make decisions. Four, analyze, solve, and counsel. Number five, do friendship shoulder to shoulder. And number six, to sexually understand and know. And we could comment on a number of these. I want you to comment on the last one Mm because I I think this is a big mystery for men and women today in relating to their sons. What's going on in in a boy who is seated with these desires, and he's emerging through puberty. And you're talking about the sexual component there, yeah. that last one. Yeah. yeah, well, that's a huge one, and it's very difficult. And this also explains why boys are quiet, because boys are visually oriented, and they're very aware of nudity. They're very aware of the anatomy of the female, but they know that they shouldn't give voice to that. And sometimes you'll see boys being quiet, and you, you ask him what he's thinking. He's not going to tell you what he's thinking, and you just need to understand, though, he's becoming aware of his world. It's important that a mother not shame him for that. And I think that's, again, where the role of the father can come in. But definitely, he is going to have an interest in human sexuality. It doesn't mean that he's going to cross over on the line, but it definitely means he's going to be very aware, he's going to be very cognizant of this, and he's going to be wondering about this. This is where the father can come in. This is where if you've got a family unit where the elder men, the uncles, whatever, can begin to give voice to this. But what's happening today quite often is boys are not having anyone talk to them about this. They're getting this exposure from from a peer. They're getting pictures and so on and so forth. And our boys are not the enemy in the pornography area. They are the victim of the enemy. It's women involved in this industry, and there are men involved in this industry that ought to be confronted because they know exactly what they're doing. But don't see your son as the enemy here if he's crossed that line. But I think in the broad brushstroke, we've got to just take a breath here. I talk about uh, Shawnee Feldhahn's work there about her boy and some of the four-year-old comments. It begins early on, and how how are we going to begin to address that? And uh, in the book, we try to unpack that. But we just need to realize God made this. He designed this, and it's going to be part and parcel of this kind of thing. And you've got to just accept that and not shame. The important thing is not to shame the boy, particularly if you see him looking at something. You know, I remember our boys, uh, there was pornography on the pathway, you know, and we just said, if you see something's not right, let us know. And Jonathan came to us. And I honored him for that. I honored him rather than, what did you do? Did you look? No, thank you for telling me. I honored the integrity of him following through instead of shaming. And I know that he's going to want to look at that. I would have wanted to look at that. So it's a matter of coming to this realization, but also having the father speak into this because it's very difficult for a mother to fully grasp this. And it'd be so easy to begin to conclude that there's something seriously wrong with him. It's not a matter of if your son's going to see this stuff. Yeah. Starting at younger and younger ages down to eight, nine, ten. You can do a good job in your home controlling things. Because this is a screen generation, you can't control what is put in front of your son's face. And so I think the coaching you just gave moms to be a shock absorber at the point maybe their son good gets exposed, but to step in and keep loving and say, I'm so glad you trusted me. You've been a bit surprised by the response mothers have given you to this book, haven't you? Oh, yeah. You know, you've got story after story, you know, like, uh, and it happens not just four-year-olds, it's 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 22-year-olds. Here's my relationship with my 22-year-old son improved overnight. Who knew that simple changes in words could make such a difference? Now I tell him how much I appreciate him. That would be one of those synonyms. And he tears up. Before I told him I loved him and got back, "I, I know, I know, I love you too, mom. Learning the right words to get my feelings across in a way they can be assimilated was so easy. Hmm. And that's one of the points I want to make. This, don't, don't make this more complex. Women start beating up on themselves at a certain point. They move into shame because they look back. Boys do let certain things roll off their, their back like water off a duck's back. They don't personalize it in the same way maybe a daughter would toward the father. Boys know mom loves them. And so you have a lot of grace here, a lot of room. So do not move into shame and do not beat yourself up. Because here's what happens. Uh, a mother wrote, 
Uh, if my son does something that is not worthy of respect, I can quickly fall into this trap of disappointment and even disdain. It then gives me a feeling of, oh, he might never change. Then I feel like a bad mom because I feel indirectly that his behavior is somehow my fault or reflects on me. After this, I probably give off this attitude of disappointment, and I know only too well that my son can tell. The very hardest thing, then, is to see your son defeated and down. As mothers, she said, we practice and look for ways to love, but maybe more importantly, we should look for opportunities and ways to respect our sons. Another woman this is like an 11-year-old boy. When my son gives me his insight, here would be the, the G-U-I-D-E-S insight. She said, when my son gives me his insight, I say, I really respect what you have to say, or I respect the way you handle that situation, or I really respect how you are taking initiative to get things done and follow through with. She said, these things have made my son smile like I have never seen. I talk more about respect with regard to sporting events and showing respect for other opponents. My son knows without a doubt that I love him. Now I feel he knows that I value him and value his ideas, which I may not have done so well in the past. Thank you for sharing God's message. The key words that I'm picking up, whether you're a mom or a stepmom, appreciation. Say the word compliment. Give compliments to your son. Praise him for something. Show honor to him and use that word, you're honorable. You're worthy of respect. Those words are speaking directly to his soul. You keep using the, the word spirit. It It's to the inner core of who he is. I had a guy say to me once, Ron, I'd much rather admit that I'm a sinner than admit that I'm a failure. We carry so much weight on us as men, and, uh, and boys are feeling it already. It's the language of our heart. Are we enough? And when mom says, you're, you're enough, I love you, I care for you, I really approve of who you are. Now, I didn't like what you just did, now, knock right. it off. Right. <laughs> right. It, that, there's a balance there that just opens him up to mom's guidance and leadership right. and where she takes him. Well, and, I, and it's important to honor those character qualities, not just, you know, I, I just really respect the fact that you, you know, you're so handsome. Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't have anything to do with that. So unchangeable features are not what we're talking about, but character qualities, thinking about that, but also trying to see the good and the bad. I had a mother this week, adult son, who doesn't, he's rejecting the faith at this point and doesn't want to participate in some of the Christian things that they're doing and was very open about that, just said to his mom, no, she's very sensitive. And so, but he's an adult and he just kind of said it. I said, you can honor him for his integrity. I want you to write him a note and say, you know what? I really appreciate it. I know that was not easy for you to do, but you're seeking to be a man of integrity who's true to your own convictions right now. And I know that wasn't easy for you to say no to that, but I just want to express my honor to you and my respect for your integrity in the family unit. I want to just jump in here and say, I think that is very significant what you just said, because our tendency, I think, in the body of Christ, when we have a concern for somebody's life, and in this case, a mother and her son and his lack of faith, we feel like if I say anything nice, that somehow I'm blessing their lack of faith. I'm somehow giving permission to it, and I don't want to do that. So what we end up doing is saying, well, the better thing would be to do is to emotionally detach and unhook and show them my disapproval for who they are. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. If you want to gain influence, increase your influence, move toward them with words that affirm his spirit. I'm thinking about the first book you wrote, and it was about marriage, not about parenting. But one of the chapters in that book was the power of positive words. And and at the core, that's what we're talking about here. Our words have great power in, in each other's lives. Yeah, we talked about how words are like seeds. What you plant is what you grow. So be careful what you sow. <laughs> Moms, you're powerful. Don't forget it. Very powerful in a boy's life, a young man's life, and an older young man's life, by the way, all the way into adulthood. Don't miss what Emerson just said there at the end. Adult children are still impacted by your words. Get this book. Dig into it. It's valuable. Yeah, it'll give you the words to use so that you can connect heart to heart with your son. Again, the title of the book is Mother and Son, The Respect Effect. The subtitle says, Love is Important, but it's Respect That's the Key to Your Son's Heart. 
The book is by Emerson Egrich, who's been our guest today, and you can order your copy when you go online at familylifetoday.com or call to order 1-800-FL-TODAY is the number. Again, the website, familylifetoday.com, and the toll-free number is 1-800-358-6329. 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word TODAY. I know a lot of our listeners have been to one of our Weekend to Remember Marriage getaways. I know even more of you have never been. In fact, we run into listeners all the time, Dennis, and we say, so have you been to one of our getaways? And they say, oh, we've always wanted to go, but we haven't done it. If you've never been to a getaway, you need to invest in your marriage. Get some time, get away, and enjoy a weekend together where you learn what the Bible has to say about building a strong marriage. And if your pastor has never been to a getaway, why don't you let him know that at Family Life, we cover the registration cost for pastors and spouses to attend. We want them to be, I was going to say our guests, but really they're your guests because we cover this cost because we have a scholarship fund where listeners have contributed so that we can make sure pastors and spouses are able to attend. Right now, that scholarship fund is, the, the, the funds are getting a little depleted. So this month, we're asking listeners, would you help us be able to continue scholarshipping pastors and spouses to a getaway? You can do that by contributing to the scholarship fund online at familylifetoday.com or call to contribute. 1-800-FL-TODAY is the number. When you designate your gift for the scholarship fund, all of those funds will go to covering the registration cost for a getaway for pastors and spouses. Again, you can donate at familylifetoday.com or you can call to donate 1-800-FL-TODAY and your donations are tax deductible. And then make sure your pastor knows about the scholarship fund and encourage him to get a weekend away with his wife and enjoy a getaway. Now, be sure to be back with us tomorrow when we're going to talk about some of the hardball questions that teenagers sometimes toss our way as parents, things about what's going on in the culture, ideas they've heard at school, things they're wondering about. Have you ever wondered what's the best way to answer some of these questions? Well, Elise Fitzpatrick and her daughter Jessica Thompson are going to be here tomorrow to talk about answering the tough questions your kids ask. Hope you can tune in for that. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch, along with our entire broadcast production team. On behalf of our host, Dennis Rainey, I'm Bob Lapine. We will see you back tomorrow for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas, a crew ministry. Help for today. Hope for tomorrow.